Thank All you. right, so we're going to talk creative financing now. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm going to bring uh, so three gentlemen on, onto the uh, stage. This so is before right. we kind of kick things off, you know, these three gentlemen um, are definitely two, involved. Two gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> In my head, he's there. I see okay, him. We'll go he's, he's coming. Uh, but these two gentlemen, they are focused on creative financing. We want to just pick their brains a little bit more about why you know people look at creative financing and some of the solutions that are available. So I'll start with Sterling. Sterling, you've got your program, Holdfolio, that you're a part of. Can you give a little introduction and background on yourself? Yeah, so myself, uh, most of you may have seen me. I'm a blog contributor on biggerpockets.com where I share my experiences in the industry and started about the late 2008, 2009 where shit kind of hit the fan on the construction side and worked, worked my way into that and then found a mentor about 2014, 2015 and did development on historic apartment buildings and then purchased just a little over 150 uh, single family homes between. Oh, yes, okay, can you hear me now? Okay. But yeah, so now just primarily focusing on uh, purchasing, income producing, uh, multifamily holding. But yeah, that's pretty much it on that. Uh, excellent. And then Dan, would you talk a little bit more about Realty Shares? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm, my name is Dan Niemeyer. Uh, I'm a director of investments at Realty Shares. Uh, we're a San Francisco based crowdfunding platform. Uh, we provide everything from senior debt to PREF to MES to joint venture equity for commercial projects. Uh, we're focused really on deals sort of in the sub $20 million space. Um, so doing bridge loans from call it 1 million to 20 million and then we're investing in equity and also subordinate debt and preferred equity in MES and sort of that one to $5 million check size. So really trying to focus sort of on that, you know, sub institutional level uh, asset class uh, stuff that's you know flying a little bit below the radar um, and a little bit harder to, to raise equity and in, in, in some cases debt for, but debt is everywhere. So there you go, Daniel. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry. Just <laughs> schmoozing in the uh, lobby there. No worries. In, fair, in <laughs> fairness to Daniel, he was a late substitution, so glad you were able to make it out. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you do with Renovo. Uh, sure. So Renovo, um, we're a private non-bank lender. Uh, local to Chicago, so this is our main main market. Uh, we serve real estate investors, that's all we do, um, with uh, capital. So whether it's a fix and flip all the way to a bridge loan to buy a, an apartment building, um, land, new construction, it's all value add, um, flexible, creative capital, which I guess fits in well with this. Panel. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things we want to get out of today is really understanding um, where to look for creative financing and making sure that our investors have different sources and options available. Sterling, I want to start with you. From a creative standpoint, um, walk about the need for creative financing on those first early deals and kind of what you're doing currently. Yeah, so on those first deals, we're a uh, portfolio crowdfunding real estate uh, platform. And on those first deals, it was 10. We took portfolios of 10 properties, we would purchase them distressed condition, and we would use our own private money to fund those deals and then get them fully stabilized. And then that's when we would go to the crowdfunding uh, aspect through our investor network. And then essentially they would purchase uh, shares within that LLC that owns the properties. And then we would cash ourselves out and then go buy uh, more properties. So it was like the Burr method, but Instead of using a bank, we would just use our investor partners. So why would you avoid a bank in that situation? Well, in that specific scenario, we were able to get better terms from our investor partners. And also the longevity purposes is we were able to establish those relationships. So now that as we shift to multifamily, we have those individuals that have essentially graduated. We have the track record in providing those returns to them and just shifted and snowballed, now they're investing in the multifamily business. Nice. And Dan, with crowdfunding, I mean, I, I'm not sure how many people have used crowdfunding. I think a lot of people have heard the term and it sounds sexy, but explain a little bit more about where someone would look to use crowdfunding. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously crowdfunding has become a lot more prevalent um, over the last you know, three or four years. I know there's at least one or two people uh, out here that we've worked with um, and you know, there's a lot of different options out there with respect to different crowdfunding platforms. 
Um, we all do a little bit, you know, slightly different things. Uh, you have, you know, platforms that are focused specifically on single family flips. You have platforms like Realty Shares that are, you know, really shifted towards, you know, commercial primarily, you know, a lot of multifamily. Um, crowdfunding is, it provides, I guess, an opportunity to, to be very creative with how you're, you're raising your capital, whether you're looking for, you know, just simple bridge debt um, or, you know, everything to joint venture equity. Um, you know, typically, you know, for larger deals, if, you know, you're a multifamily owner and, you know, you're looking to buy like a $10 million project, um, you know, there's not a lot of institutional capital that's gonna, you know, jump out of their seat for, you know, a $2 million equity check uh, for a $10 million deal. Um, so that sort of leaves the onus on the sponsor to, you know, pound the pavement and go out and, you know, talk to their friends and family, their, their country club, you know, however, you know, you would raise money sort of in the old days. Um, but that's, you know, it's, it's labor intensive and it, and it takes a long time. Um, so, you know, we've sort of streamlined that, that process to, you know, you basically come to us. Um, you know, we have our network of, call it, you know, 100,000 accredited investors that are constantly investing in deals. And, you know, you can sort of leave the, the fundraising to us and focus on, you know, what you guys are, are best at, which is, you know, going out and finding deals and, you know, executing on your, your business plan. Um, so, you know, something that may have taken you, you know, three to six months to go out and raise two or three million dollars, you know, that's something we can do in, you know, 30, 45 days. So I'm sure getting a million or two million dollars in 30 or 45 days sounds enticing. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that there's also some more restrictions and you won't just let anybody throw a deal up on your site, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, you know, there, there's some crowdfunding platforms that, that are sort of like listing platforms like that where, you know, you pay a fee, you, you put your OM up on the website, um, you know, investors can come in and subscribe to, you know, your deal. Um, with Realty Shares, it's a little bit more like dealing with, you know, a private lender or, you know, in a private equity fund or like a hedge fund where, you know, you submit your deal to our underwriters, we're going to vet the deal, we're going to vet you as the borrower, the sponsor, um, you know, ultimately we're going to commit to raising, you know, two, three, four, five million dollars uh, for your deal. Um, you know, one of the other, you know, misconceptions about crowdfunding and sort of what we're doing is, um, it's not like you have a hundred individual investors in your deal where you're, you know, you're, you're getting calls every day, you know, for updates on what's going on with the deal. Um, we're more, more of a syndicator, so we'll create a special purpose LLC, sort of like what Sterling was talking about, um, and then we'll, you know, close the deal on our, on our balance sheet, and then we'll back and syndicate the deal to our investors. So we just offer them shares in that LLC that we create as, you know, the lender or the LP. So uh, as much as, you know, everybody might want, you know, three million bucks, uh, you, you gotta go through, you know, me and my underwriters first. There you go, good. So Daniel, we talked a little bit about uh, the need for opportunities and creative financing. Talk to us about why someone would look at Renovo if they can qualify for trad traditional financing. Sure, um, so the good thing is, uh, Many or vast majority of our clients are bankable, um, right? It's it's not always that you can't get it. It's but everyone wakes up and says, "I want ten or twelve percent money," right? <laughs> That's what everyone did here this morning. That was your goal to get twelve percent money. That was my goal, right? Yeah. Vince, for sure. Uh, no, but so there's always a there's always a, a reason behind it. So. Um, you know, just to name a few, it's, it's, uh, it could be, you know, in a competitive market like this, when you're looking at distressed real estate, um, that needs to be renovated. A lot of banks or traditional lenders don't want to look at the, you know, the, the ugly, smelly property, right? Um, it could be that most of your deals have to close in, in 10 days or two weeks. So how are you going to compete with cash, right, if it's going to take maybe 30, 60, 90 days to get it done? Um, it could be equity. So, how many? If you're going to grow, how many deals can you do at 20%, 30% down? Uh, maybe you need a lender will consider 85, 90% of the project. Um, or it could be uh, getting creative to use a free and clear rental property so you could buy your next property with no money down. So, it has something to do typically with leverage, velocity, and scale, um, and hands-on service. So if you're gonna do a construction project, um, you know, you probably wanna work with a lender who knows something about how 
construction works and has asset management and can do construction draws in a day or two. So it's, it's just the pace at which those projects are gonna go. What's the most creative deal and creative financing structure you've done so far for everybody? I think the first one that I had with my, my first partner, which that partnership went south, that's a whole different story in <laughs> itself. And with that, it was just basically before that partnership, I started working with that individual for free because they were essentially a mentor of mine. And that's one thing I'd recommend for the newbies that are looking to get started in the industry is to, to find a mentor. And if you can, work for that individual for free and gain all of their knowledge. And that first partnership was I didn't have the necessary capital to purchase the single family house. So what I did was I said, there's this great deal. And how about you bring all the capital and we'll split everything 50-50. So that's how that broke down in terms of the financing side. He brought all the capital. I did all the legwork. Uh, yeah, so we had, a, we had a deal, I want to say it was like six months ago. We had a guy in Seattle. He was, he was trying to buy a, you know, I want to, probably 25-unit uh, student housing project at uh, University of Seattle, or University of Washington in Seattle. And he didn't have the money for a down payment. Uh, it was about a $10 million acquisition. Um, so he owned probably you know, a portfolio of like eight to 10, uh, th two to four unit single or student housing uh, buildings. Uh, he already had debt on the, on the properties, um, but you know, he had bank debt at call it you know, 60, 65% uh, leverage. So we came in basically, you know, put a second on all of his existing uh, assets that he had and gave him about, you know, two, three million bucks, uh, you know, just based on, you know, the security and the uh, existing uh, collateral. And then that was able to cover his down payment um, for, for the new acquisition. And we also originated the senior debt and also took a second uh, on that property as well. Uh, so it was <laughs> a lot of moving pieces, um, but it was, you know, all in probably a 13 or 14 million dollar deal. And uh, I think we closed it in about three weeks. So pretty, pretty so quick execution. you did all execution. that in three weeks? Yeah. It's, that's, that's what we do at Realty Shares, man. We close quick. Um, I don't know if it's the most creative, but I'll just pick the one that's <laughs> closest to mine here. They, they all seem to have some creativity. Um, so just this morning, repeat client wants to buy a... Um, a house they really want to get. It's got to close by the end of May. Um, they have money in the bank. I think you know we'll just call it 100,000 bucks in the bank. But if they put their down payment down on this deal, they've got I don't know four or five others going. It's really going to deplete reserves. It's going to make it tough to keep other construction projects going. So what we did, uh, two of the outstanding projects are about to hit the market. Their LTVs, uh, loan to values on those are are tremendous. So we're just going to fund 100% of this new deal. And when each of the next two uh, projects sell that are actually funded by us also, we'll just take 10% when you know, property A sells, 10% when B sells. So he gets to uh, stretch out his cash reserves, uh, make sure his business can keep running. Um, it'd be great to get the down payment now, but you know, the hamstring, the, the business doesn't make any sense either. So. So what do you look for? I mean, I mean, that's a crazy unique structure and flexibility when we talk about creative financing. What do you look for in that investor to even get to the point where you're willing to take them on in that, that capacity? Sure. Uh, for us, it all starts with, we talk about borrower, project, and match. So, um, you know, to us, it always, forget the project or what you're working on. It's always, because we're local, it's always a face-to-face -face meeting to start. And who... It's funny and people laugh. I think you laugh when we talk. It's like, you know, start with what's your name, right? Because you get the, all these tax returns and bank statements and all project scopes and it's, you forget at the end of the day that there's like a human at the other end of this. So who's this person? What are you trying to accomplish? And can we as a company actually help you accomplish that? Um, potentially beyond just the money. Um, but then, okay, who are you as a person? But where are you focused, what areas, what's your expertise, how many projects have you done, what's your capacity? So I can get comfortable in this case because I know this person's business plan up and down. I know, who, I know their capacity, I know their skill set, I know where they want to get, right? So sometimes, I'll just use the same example. They've called me in the past and brought up a, another idea and I'm like, that's 
I got to tell you, I think you're totally veering from your business plan. And I think that's not going to, in the long run, that's not going to be beneficial in that case, right? So I think it starts with that. So I was asking the same question. What do you look for? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're not a local bank or a local lender. Um, we're national. We're, you know, sort of tech driven and, you know, trying to, trying to scale and do a lot of deals. Um, so, you know, first it, you know, it's all about the story. I mean, we're, we're flexible. We're, you know, we're, we'll listen to anything and everything. Um, you know, if, if there's a good story, if we can understand, you know, the exit strategy, um, you know, there, there's a competence level with the borrower, of course. Um, and, you know, we can see our exit and we can get comfortable with obviously the, you know, the, the background credit experience of the sponsor. Um, you know, that's really what we're looking for. Um, but, you know, it, it, we're, we're receptive to, to, you know, like I said, anything and everything. So, um, you know, it, it helps to have a previous relationship. It helps to have somebody that you've done a deal with before in the past. Um, you know, and be, you know, it, when we have done deals with, you know, a repeat borrower, we are more likely to do something that, you know, another, another lender might not do. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, sort of at, taking it back to the whole concept of crowdfunding is the more deals you do on our platform, you know, you, you develop a little bit of a following among, you know, our, our investors on the platform. So if they like you and you've, you know, you've done well in the past, they're, they're willing to, you know, do some, some riskier stuff. Uh, we, we just closed the deal. We had originated a bridge loan for a borrower in Charlotte last year. Um, it was, you know, 100% occupied. He was going to do some value add. Um, you know, we gave him 80% financing uh, between a first and a second structure. And, uh, you know, he increased value over the first nine months by like $5 million. And, you know, he just knocked it out of the park, did exactly what he said he was going to do, um, you know, has it 100% occupied again, you know, at, you know, rents 30% over market uh, or, you know, above what they, where they were. Um, so we came back and we, we upsized our second and refinanced our second and gave him, you know, two million bucks in cash out nine months after, you know, he bought the property for six million bucks. Now we're, you know, we're levered at seven million on, a, you know, a $12.5 million value. Uh, most lenders aren't going to do that, and you know we were just giving them you know money to go out and buy another deal because the guy's hungry and you know why not right? He's he crushed it. Hopefully he'll crush it again. Yeah, that's great. So Sterling, you've got a different angle as the investor slash operator. Yeah. What do you look for when bringing investors in for your kind of creative financing structure? It's more of do their interests align. If they're looking to get in, get out. Obviously, we're not the right partners for them because we're more of a buy and hold type philosophy five, seven year whole period, if that person is, I want to put my capital in and I want to double it or triple it within six months, then, well, especially, that's not ideal, not so much. But if they're, just if the interest align is the main thing that we're primarily focusing on. So as you guys think about, I mean, we've heard everyone talk earlier today about how cheap it is to get capital and cheap it is to get financing. Um, and we've talked a little bit about some of the advantages being able to move quicker and structure deals in a unique way. What are some of those drawbacks outside of the 12 or 15 percent, which we know? <laughs> it could be lower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it really all depends on, on the deal, you know, and it depends on the business plan and, you know, what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, there's, there's obviously really cheap money out there. I mean, you can get agency debt for multifamily at 80 percent loan to value at, you know, a four, four and a half percent rate. Um, but, you know, with cap rates sort of going down, interest rates sort of rising a little bit, it's, it's getting tougher to, you know, get that max leverage because uh, your debt service coverage constrained or, you know, rents are 10, 20 percent below market. So, you know, and you have a, you have a pretty, pretty sizable prepayment penalty with that kind of stuff. You know, it's a five-year deal. You might have a five, four, three, two, one uh, prepayment sort of step down prepayment penalty. And you might be better off, you know, going with a 12-month bridge at, you know, eight or nine percent, so you can capture that upside, you know, in month 12, um, and you know, refinance with that perm loan at, you know, full proceeds, and you know, really lock yourself into that low rate without, you know, losing, losing some of that, you know, additional equity that, you know, you're you're building in the property. 
Um, you know, same thing with most banks. I mean, you're gonna have a prepayment penalty. Um, you're gonna have at least like a 12 month lockout usually on like a two year deal. Um, and then, you know, obviously speed of execution is, is really important and certainty of execution. Uh, I've heard a thousand stories of, you know, Sterling and I were just talking about it, where Freddie or Fannie, they'll take you through the process. You'll go, you know, 45, 60 days. And then all of a sudden, deferred maintenance, it's out and you're stuck having to close in a week and All cash. you don't have any money, right? Yeah, yeah. Hope, yeah, I mean, you're lucky yeah, you had the cash, yeah. but like a lot of these borrowers don't. So, um, you know, there's always, there's always something to the deal that, you know, is gonna sort of tip the, turn the tables either way. So we heard uh, Frank was adamant about, you know, making sure people stay in their lanes, right? And I know a lot of investors are, part of the reason everyone's here today is to grow. Maybe that's to grow into a different vertical. Maybe you haven't flipped the house yet and you're looking to get into flipping. Maybe you're looking to get into multifamily. Maybe you're looking to get into syndication. For those folks who are looking to kind of expand and take the next step, what is the opportunity or where can they go when, it, when you look, think about financing? And as you are underwriting deals and someone doesn't have that experience, what kind of advice would you give them as far as you know, putting themselves in a position to get financing there? I'll take this. I'll take it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the common <laughs> theme has been, you know, partner with someone that, that has experience. Um, you know, if, you're, if you do have experience sort of with single family and you're trying to make the jump to, to small multifamily, um, you know, that's, that's a story that we, we can get comfortable with. You know, it's, in my opinion, almost tougher to operate a portfolio of single family rentals that are, you know, scattered around in, in, in MSA versus, you know, buying a, 30 unit multifamily asset. Um, you know, there's challenges to, you know, the property management that isn't uh, sort of applicable to multifamily. Um, so if you can demonstrate that, I think, you know, we can get comfortable there. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not really looking for, you know, and I don't know if this is true of you guys, but we're not really looking for higher rates for, you know, to compensate for less experience. We're generally gonna look more, you know, reducing proceeds. Um, and sort of keeping that rate the same. So, you know, typically on multifamily, we'll go to like 85% uh, loan to value for an experienced developer. But if you haven't done a deal, um, you know, we might be at 70, 75. Um, just so we know, you know, if you, if you don't execute on your value add plan, there's still an exit for us um, because we can, you know, just you can refi with, you know, bank or uh, agency or, or what have you. Yeah, I'd say partner as much as you can with someone who's experienced the First deal that I had, I had made when I transitioned to the single family to the multifamily was I reached out to four or five other developers or uh, highly achievable uh, investors who had been there, did that, got their eyes on it, and basically went through the entire process that they had completed. What was the contractor that you used? Walked into their office. This is our plan. Just cold off. Just walk right into their office. Here's what we're looking to do. What type of flooring would you use? Uh, this is the contractor and kind of just went through, uh, just picked their brain essentially. I mean, you just got to basically reverse engineer and find out who's doing what and yeah, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah I'm going to uh, kind of veer away from the money for a minute and go with what uh, Sterling right, was saying mm -hmm. and, and just access and exposure to contacts, right? So, um, you know, working with a client, if they own... 30 units now and they're all two to four unit buildings, but they wanna to get to 500 units and eventually start going up, right? Well, we should probably be having coffee, lunch, dinner with people that own 500 units. And like they've done it before and people have done it before, so how do you get in front of and not be afraid to say like, this is where I wanna go. You're kinda of there, how do I learn from you and so I can, I can know where what does it look like to be there? Do I actually want to be there? And what, what are the challenges of getting there? Um, and come up with your two year, three year, five year plan, right? It's not going to happen overnight. It doesn't have to happen overnight. Um, but you got to take the time to learn and be surprised. Like the higher up you go and the more successful people get, kind of the more willing they are to share that and help you. I agree. So go get the help. All right, so I wanna open it up. I mean, creative finance, I'm sure people have maybe specific questions and things that they wanna ask. Um, so we'll start with some Q&A. Yeah, I'll 
That was the trigger for questions. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry, my question is actually from the investor side, since all of what you speak on is very similar. Um, have you had any, I don't know if you call them sponsors or operators, but basically any sponsors or operators fail where basically the uh, like credit risk, what's the credit risk in what you guys operate? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've had, we've had you know, we've deployed $800 million in real estate transactions over the last five years. Uh, we've, had, we've had some failures. Um, you know, it's generally gonna come down to, you know, just the execution of, you know, the, the construction, uh, which I think was sort of touched down in the last panel. I mean, you make your money on the buy, you lose your money on the construction. Um, you know, that, that's why we wanna, be, we wanna be really, really comfortable with the operator, with the experience, um, and then, also, just really comfortable with, um, you know, with our leverage point and our exit. Um, even if, you know, worst case, you know, they aren't able to complete the job, um, you know, we're not going to, and for that reason, we're not going to do a whole lot of, you know, bridge loans where there's a heavy, heavy construction component to the deal. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we we want to be mainly sort of a value add, uh, light value add lender where, you know, you're doing 7,500 bucks a door and renovations, um, you know, sort of taking something from a you know, C plus to a B minus uh, type deal. Um, you know, I think because we're, we're a national lender and we're sort of an online uh, crowdfunding company, you know, we don't have a presence in all these markets. So you're probably better off on you know, a heavier construction deal to go with you know, a local lender who can take over the project if they have to and actually finish it. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest thing for us is just you know, try to avoid Stuff that's like really, really, you know, risky with respect to execution, uh, just on the on the construction. Can I? I'm curious where the question comes from. Like, so uh, I've been considering some of those venues from the investors, real home mortgage insurance. Mm -hmm. And as an investor, I'm always concerned what's the credit risk if yeah. I were to put money into realty shares. How often does an operator fail such that I don't get my money back? Um, yeah, okay, that's, that's a good question. Right. Um, I, I mean, it depends, you know, like if, you know, we, we stopped doing single family residential bridge loans um, six months ago, partly for that reason, you know, they're, they're inherently pretty risky. Um, and, you know, we focus more on commercial now. I would say, you know, on our commercial debt program, um, that's relatively new. We haven't had any foreclosures or loss of principal on any of those deals yet. Um, but, you know, it's, you have to understand that it's a you know it's a real estate deal. There's inherent risk to the deal. You know, you're we There's have risk. <laughs> yes. Uh, so and that's why we offer a lot of different options. You know, you have senior debt, which you know you're going to get a reasonably good return. We have you know subordinate debt. It's obviously more risky. Um, and then we have JV equity, where you know you could lose everything. Um, you know, it's just a matter of you know you doing your research on the website, um, you know, going through all of our underwriting, you know, and sort of making that decision for yourself. Um, you know, we're not, a, we're not an investment advisor. I have to do that disclaimer real quick. Um, so, you know, we're doing the best we can to vet the deals and, you know, we have a great underwriting team that's, you know, putting their stamp of approval on their deals. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's always the chance that, you know, whether it's the market or, you know, the operator is gonna, gonna fail you know, it could happen, and we're trying to do everything we can to mitigate that. The radio voice. <laughs> Smooth jazz. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I was curious what you all think about the terms of financing available right now, and, you know, we tend to have this credit cycle when things are really good and prices are high, there's lots of money out there, credit tends to be plentiful and at very favorable terms to borrowers sometimes. Whereas what we saw in the crisis, there was no money available, even though things were cheap. Um, so do you see a loosening of credit when you have all these different lenders competing against each other? Or have you seen terms roughly stay the same over the last three, four years? Besides the super tight part of the, the credit cycle of the financial crisis. I've personally seen the regional banks looking to compete, or the smaller banks looking to compete with uh, Freddie and uh, the Fannie Max. And just recently we had our regional, they're doing interest only for one to two year periods and their amortizations are a little bit longer. So we we'll definitely see those type of banks being more aggressive to compete with the larger agencies. 
Yeah, no, I, I think, I think especially bridge lending, the competition is fierce. Um, you know, there's a bridge lender on every street corner, pretty much. Um, so, you know, stuff that we were, we were getting done, you know, on a fixed rate, you know, nine and a half percent loan at two points, you know, that's, you know, there's lenders out there that are doing that at eight and one now. Um, you know, and it's a little bit different, I guess, on the, on the agency side, because, you know, they're more tied to, you know, ind indices and, you know, rates are actually going up, um, which is actually making, making bridge lenders a little bit more of a better option, because um, that spread is, is compressing a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, every deal, every deal that I see, there's, there's three or four other term sheets out there. Um, and I mean, not even on the, on the money side, I mean, there's 30 or 40 offers on the property. Um, so, you know, the financing's competitive, it's great for the, for the borrower, but the deals are also really competitive and, you know, and cap rates are compressing, rates are going up, margins are really thin, so, you know, it's making deals harder and harder to do, um, just from, like, an underwriting perspective. I, I'll just second all that, but there's no question that uh, capital is willing to take, um, you know, more risk for less reward, right, in today's market. Lots of competition. That, uh, it's actually good for the lenders, too. So where we source capital from uh, is willing to kind of do the same thing. Um, so we're having lots of interesting conversations with our, with our lenders and our clients. Um, and it's, it's roughly the same, you know, hey, there's, I got a text last night, other lenders at 8%, you know, it's like, all right, cool, let's talk. Are you asking me to match or are you telling me you love the relationship and you just want to do a little better? If it's match, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you just have to say, hey, look, if that's the most important thing, that's the most important thing. Um, but I think it's, it's good, uh, but, um, if my partner were here, he would tell you a story of, of chasing that eight years ago and wishing he stayed with his past lender and didn't chase the lower rate because when the market crashed, he was not with the person who could get him through, right? Uh, so he chose rate over relationship, and I don't think he would ever do that again. So you just got to balance it out, right? Do we have any more? All right, well, let's give it up for our panel.